Hindenburg report on the Adani group has united the opposition. Uh, all I can say that Dhirubhai Ambani's rise was also quite dramatic, but Dhirubhai Ambani's decline or the decline of the Reliance Empire never happened that way. You know, much of the mainstream media today in India is completely subservient to the government. Adani Group of Mai Bandapata, Hindenburg Report to Protovanapol, Yetu Guru del Sadha Gendra Maide, Pataprota Ganaya, Paranjoy Guha, Takurtiana Adeham, Varsagal Kumbudane, Adani Group in the Proverta Nangale, Sudari Melata Nikangale Kurche, Gehana Maitene, Erdogandai, in Adeham Namoda Pomcherigan. Thank you for finding some time for us, sir. Thank you, Mr. Bupesh. Thank you. So you have been writing political economy and about corporate sector as a journalist. So when did you start it? Uh, what made you to show interest in Adani Group? I have been a journalist for 45 years. I'm 67 years old. I started my career in journalism when I was 22 years old. Mm. I've written about several corporate groups. Right. Including the Ambani's, including dozens and dozens of corporate groups in India. So, it is not that I have only selected one group. But of late you have been concentrating on others. Not, not really, not really. I have written about the Ambani's, I have written a book on the Ambani's. Yes. But when a person becomes the second richest man in the world, the third richest man in the world, not just the richest man in India, the richest man in Asia, it is but natural that as a journalist, I would be trying to find out more about the working of this group. So it was quite natural for you That's to concentrate right. on Adani. Not concentrate, write about it. Right because about while I was writing about Adani, I was also writing about other groups. I wrote about the Crompton Greaves group. I wrote about so many groups. If you go through my own website, paranjoy.in, you will find dozens and dozens of groups about which I've written, including Ambani, the, the older what? Ambani. Dhirubhai Ambani. Uh, Dhirubhai Ambani's older son, Mukesh Ambani. Mm, Mukesh Ambani, yeah. That's right. And Anil Ambani. Now the Hindenburg report has come. The position you have taken earlier by investigating into the uh, different malpractices that has been committed by Adani, your position stand vindicated by this report? Yes, I do think so. Uh, I have been writing about the Adani group on and off from 2015 onwards. My first major exclusive report on the group came in April of 2016, soon after I became the editor of the Economic and Political Weekly. So, you know, some of us have been writing about what the government agencies have been saying, not I. Mm. What the Directorate of Revenue Intelligence has been saying about allegations of over-invoicing of coal and power equipment. So, I have merely reported, I'm a reporter primarily. I've write, written about what the government has been doing or not doing. So, uh, from the time I uh, became the editor of the Economic and Political Weekly in April of 2016, till I resign in July 2018. But writing about Adani cost you a job now? If, you, if you want to interpret it that way, you can. Uh, it was like this, that you can read that article, arrive at your own conclusion, because that article was republished in The Wire. Yes. It has a title, Modi Government's 500 crore bonanza to Adani. It was published in June of 2017. It talked about how the rules relating to power projects in special economic zones had been changed. And the biggest beneficiary was Adani Power. It also talked about how the government was processing an application for refund of customs duties worth more than 500 crore without first checking whether the duty had been paid in the first place. You know, you pay more income tax so you can apply for a refund to the income tax department. But first you pay the tax, then you can apply then, for yeah. it. But in this case, the government was processing an application for refund of customs duties without yeah. checking whether the money had been paid. So after my article appeared, uh, I don't think the money ever went to him. Now, what happened is, as far as the Economic and Political Weekly is concerned, the trustees, they felt that I had committed an act of grave impropriety 
because I had engaged the services of a lawyer pro bono to respond to a legal notice sent to the publisher, editor, writer, co-authors of this particular article. And it was also reprinted or republished by The Wire. Now, according to the Honorable Trustees of the Samiksha Trust, I did not take their prior permission or approval before engaging uh, a lawyer. That's correct. So I said, they said this was an act of grave, grave impropriety. So I said that, look, it's a technical error. I'm willing to apologize for it, but I don't think I've committed an act of grave impropriety. I'll just complete the story. Give me a few more yeah. minutes. I was told I had destroyed the ethos of the Economic and Political Weekly, which was an institution almost as old as the country. I was told I should not write any more articles in my name in the magazine because my predecessors had not. Okay. I was told the trustees were thinking of appointing a co-editor. And finally, I was told, bring this article down from the website, pull it down, and don't leave the room until it's pulled down. Okay. So. It takes a few minutes to pull down an article. I asked a former colleague of mine, please pull it down. Then I said, check, error 404. So there was, there was no article. So I said, give me a piece of paper and I wrote out my resignation. So per se, they were not ob object, uh, objecting your article on uh, Adani. They, they were pointing out some you know, technicalities. This, is, this no? is the question they can answer. Mm. They said I hadn't done the due diligence or the due process. It do, did not meet the editorial standards of the Economic and Political Weekly. I went public. I told the world about what yes, had happened. Sir. After that, I was surprised. There were so many people who came out in my support, including two Nobel laureates, Professor Amartya Sen, Chow. Professor Angus Deaton, Professor no, uh, uh, very well-regarded scholar, Professor Noam Chomsky, and hundreds of other people. And then there was a sort of a slanging match that went on. Soon thereafter, the Adani group had instituted a civil case and a defamation case against The Wire, me, and the three co-authors I had. Then, the magistrate in Bhuj, in the district Kutch in Gujarat, said, Wire, you don't have to bring down the article. Remove one word and remove one line, which The Wire did. And you can still see. Yeah. Go and read it yourself. Then after that, much to my surprise and to many, many people's surprise, in May of 2019, just before the Lok Sabha election results were announced, the defamation case against everybody, the wire, my co-authors, were withdrawn by the lawyers representing Adani, except me. So, so you are still facing defamation case from Adani? Absolutely. After that, what happened? I went to court, I went to the court. Then in January of 2021, a non-bailable warrant of arrest was issued against me. I got to know about it from the correspondent of the PTI, the Press Trust of India. It reached the PTI before it reached my own lawyer. That so, an arrest warrant has been issued against you? Non-bailable arrest warrant. My lawyer argue, uh, argued that this was illegal because according to the Supreme Court's guidelines, the charge against me, the allegation against me was non-appearance in court. So they, they filed this defamation, uh, defamation suit against you for the article that you have written no, in EPW? No, for non-appearance in court. Okay. The trial is yet to begin. So according to my lawyer, the Supreme Court rules say that for non-appearance in court, that is if I do not appear to court, appear in court, the magistrate can first issue a bailable warrant. If I still don't appear in court, then a non-bailable warrant can, can be issued. So then I appeared in court. This was, mind you, mm. between the first phase and the second phase of the corona, the, ap, ap, uh, the pandemic. Okay. So I, I appeared once in February. I again appeared in March. That case is still going on. I don't know when, I mean, nothing has happened on their side at least. They haven't moved the trial. So the point I'm trying to make is that I feel vindicated because the Hindenburg report has written about all this. There are two other defamation cases against me where my lips have been sealed. My mouth there, has been shut. There has been a gag order against you. No? That's correct. I'm the only citizen of India against whom Lawyers representing the Adani group has moved six defamation cases. In two of these cases, they concern my co-author, Abir Das Gupta, myself, and the portal NewsClick. Because they've taken objection to an article, the headline of an article. This article appeared more than two years back. 
and it is written justice arun mishra's mm. parting gift within inverted commas of 8000 crore to adani mm. so i have been accused of lowering the esteem of the judiciary yes. not just me my co-author and the publisher so uh, that article was published in news click that's correct and after that yet another case was moved in rajasthan and prabir purakasta the head of news click yes. who is 75 years old d raghunand raghunandan who had nothing to do with the publication he's a shareholder a small shareholder he's 73 years old and myself i'm 67 we traveled from delhi to kota halfway between delhi and mumbai and from there another 120 kilometers to the district court to the gramin nyale the village court where we we applied for a brain bail bond and we uh, got people to stand for sh- as sure to sureties now this is the same series there were series of three articles that appeared so that is why uh, the i have this injunction against me from the court is that gag order still in force absolutely it is still in force but you have become you come to public and you are now i'm giving you facts yes. why why am i giving you facts in the 32000 word report of hindenburg research i am the only journalist who has been named so uh, in any way did you uh, participate in their investigation i'll give you i'll give you an answer but before that let me say there were some media organizations who have been named like the economic times like cnbc but i'm the only journalist who's been named now there why did i choose to speak out because there it has been written hindenburg research asked 88 questions in question number 84 mr adani is asked Then Mr. Adani, you believe in freedom of speech. Why have you tried to arrest a critical journalist, meaning me? Yes. yes. And then the reply that comes from Adani, the Adani group, says that we have done nothing. It's the magistrate who issued the order. So I thought it is important to clarify and give the background because the article, which is because of which I was issued this uh, non-bailable arrest warrant, right. pertains to Adani Par. The second question that you asked me. did i know any did i help hindenburg research the truth is till the 24th of january i had not even heard of hindenburg research i only knew that hindenburg was the president of germany when hitler was in power that there was a zeppelin named after him and right. this was it caught fire, fire yeah. and and people died and and later on i learned that the company had been nailed the research company had been nailed named Uh, to symbolize or epitomize a man-made disaster, they are short sellers. They are playing the market. So uh, the truth is, you are unaware. I I was I did not even know of the existence of that name. Much later, when everybody talked about Hindenburg Research, I heard that they had uh, shorted, as they say, and exposed a dozen companies. Two of these companies went under. All this happened afterwards. How long have we been fighting the defamation case again? From uh, see, the Mr. first Adani. case happened in 2017, okay. late 2017. The other two cases, the gag order has been imposed on me from September 2020. So There are two other cases. One is more recent, and one is seems to be dormant. Yes, it would have been very difficult for you to fight against a big corporate, no? No, how, no. How you manage? The whole idea is that they s- spend my time, my energy. my family also it affects my family my wife our children my sister it affects all of them there is an impact of on them but also you know though i have been lucky there are some good lawyers who have been working for me and they have not charged anything i still have to spend money if they have to travel say from ahmedabad to mundra and you have to stay one night in a hotel it is i pay for that expense if i have to come from where i am based which is gurgaon near delhi i have to pay for that that's the whole idea that's the whole idea is to make you spend your money to harass you to make you spend your time and your mental energy did you meet adani any time yes on two occasions after this defamation case was filed uh before and after, and after. Okay. i met him first uh, in may of 2017 and then i met him again in february of 2021 and on both occasions i was sworn to secrecy the first one was organized by one of his uh, corporate communications person he said you could meet him but the condition is off the record okay. so i agreed i spent one hour with him we traveled in mumbai hmm. uh, from uh, one part of mumbai to another in his car then we went i went to the hotel where he was in the second case my lawyer 
uh, he arranged a meeting with him mm -hmm. in the hope that he would uh, withdraw uh, the cases against him. That didn't happen. Uh, so what was he saying when we met, when you met him? You know, I, I was sworn to secrecy. <laughs> okay. Therefore, I can't tell you what I met okay, or okay. What, what he said. Okay. I also had a telephone conversation with him very recently. So, you know, when as a journalist, when somebody says that this meeting is off the record, then, 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 the then I have to, then I cannot unfor uh, unfortunately disclose to you in a public forum like this okay. what transpired. All I can say that the meeting lasted almost two hours, one hour and 55 minutes. There were five of us. There was Mr. Gautam Adani, there was his legal advisor, there was my lawyer, there was myself and my wife. And the matter of the fact is that the defamation case is still there. Absolutely correct. Okay. So, coming back to the Hindenburg report, uh, what you see will be the economic impact of that report. Uh, would it have any political impact as well? You know, both these questions are very difficult to answer. The truth is I don't know. All I know is what has happened. From the 24th of January till today, the prices of several shares of companies that belong to the Adani group have come down. Some have come down by 50%, some have, one has come down by 75%. These are facts. Now, you can also say that the indices, the stock market indices have come down and one of the reasons is because the Adani Group's uh, shares, share prices have come down. The second point I wanted to make is that all of us were taken aback. Uh, on the day before the budget, on, on the 31st of January, it was formally announced that, you know, 20,000 crore follow on public offer had been fully subscribed. and just after that, right. after the budget, at 10.40 at night, uh, um, it was announced that he had withdrawn, withdrawn the offer, the money would be returned, and the following morning, that is early morning on the, on the, on the, on the 2nd of February, Mr. Adani himself publicly said that, you know, there was a moral, uh, he said something to the effect that he was morally obliged to call off the public offer and return the money. So all of this was very, very surprising. And I was as surprised as anybody else was. Okay. So today, Supreme Court has refused to accept the names proposed by the government into a committee that would uh, review the, uh, the uh, mechanism of the stock market. So uh, how do you see the, all these developments? The, see, that means the Supreme Court I, has said that if we I are not taking your names, we will be forming no. our own committee. That's right. Yeah. So, uh, from what I understand, the mm. Supreme Court has noted that we will decide what to do on our own. Yes. And uh, just because the government has given the names of people in a sealed cover, the Supreme Court, in its opinion, the apex court of the country thinks that, that uh, it will not go by the wishes of the government, that it needs a process which is transparent. So, this is what I understand. I have nothing more to say to what the Supreme Court will say. So let's see, you know, all these allegations that are there in the Hindenburg report, allegations of round-tripping money, uh, related party transactions. Well, I'm just a journalist. It is up to the government. It's up, up, up to the Securities and Exchange Board of India. It's about to bodies like Reserve Bank of India, the government of India to investigate and find out whether these allegations are correct or not. So and some... it's not just me. The Trinamool Congress Lok Sabha MP, yeah, Mahua Maitro, she has gone on record. She says, one and a half years back I wrote to Sebi. And she's asking, what has happened? You have heard the speech that was made by Rahul Gandhi. 80, 18 portions of it have been censored. But you know, I find it like, honestly, quite ridiculous. Because everybody's seen the speech. It is available on YouTube. It is a bit like that BBC documentary. Yes. You know, you ban something, more people are going to watch, watch it. it. Yeah. So I think the government uh, so why uh, should this not have acted in this. Why this present dispensation, as a journalist I am asking you, see why this present dispensation uh, going out of way to propel Adani group? Is there, I, what, don't what know, is I don't know about that. I can't say anything about it. Uh, it is up to the public, it is up to you, it is up to the people to judge whether how much to what extent the rise of the Adani group has been, uh, what should I say, uh, taken place because of the government's uh, policies or programs. But it is a fact that uh, very few people knew of Mr. Gautam Adani 20 years ago. He was a college dropout, he was trading in diamonds and plastic waste. And 
the, he got the land in Mundra when the Congress government was in power in Gujarat and Keshubhai Patel was the chief minister. But the expansion of the Adani group really took place after Mr. Modi became the chief minister of Gujarat yes. in, 2020, uh, in 2001 and then after he became the prime minister of India in 2014. So th these are facts. I, I'm just only giving you facts. It's also a fact that after the Hindu-Muslim riots in 2002, uh, there was a section of in Indian industry uh, those who were part of the Confederation, Confederation of Indian, Indian Industry, yes. CII, industrialists, industrialists like Mr. Rahul Bajaj, who is no more with us, they had spoken out that this is not good for uh, industry, this is not good for business. And there was a parallel group that was set up, which was um, included Mr. Gautam Adani, among other people. And uh, from there began the Gujarat, vibrant Gujarat summits. So, uh, Mr. Gautam Adani's rise has been truly spectacular. I mean, these are facts that I can't, nobody can deny. From being 20 years ago a person who very few people knew about, to becoming the world's second richest man or third richest man, and then suddenly, equally dramatic has been the fall the in the prices of, of the shares, shares of his companies. So do you think that this uh, growth of Adani has been made possible by the neoliberal policies that we have been pursuing for the last two or three decades? You know, again, that's a difficult question for me to answer. Mr. Gautam Adani himself has said that he's, his rise has been because uh, of the policies that were followed when Mr. Rajiv Gandhi was the Prime right. Minister of India. He's also said when Narasimha Rao was the Prime Minister of India, there were policies of trade liberalization and he says that's how, I mean, that's the beginning of his journey as an entrepreneur. Uh, so, you know, it's a matter of opinion as to how you want to judge him. Uh, he was asked by Mr. Rajat Sharma. Uh, by the way, he owns also um, a portion of his uh, company's company. shares. Mm. He was asked that, what is the secret of your success? Mm. And he said, mehnat, 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 which is basically means hard work, hard. hard work, and hard work. So it's up to you to, you think so? to, to evaluate him whether his rise has been because of his hard work, because he's been a very successful entrepreneur, or because he's a crony capitalist and oligarch. The, the opinion is divided. There are different people with different views on this. I have no opinion. Do you see any, any, any uh, similarity between the rise of uh, Gautam Madani and that of uh, Dhirubhai Ambani in, late 80, in the early 80s? Is there any similarity? Uh, I don't know. Because we have studied and the wrote about yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, Ambani. A it's a difficult question to answer. Uh, all I can say that Dhirubhai Ambani's rise was also quite dramatic, but Dhirubhai Ambani's uh, decline or the decline of the Reliance Empire never happened that way. The brothers fought with each other. Yes. But if you look at other cases in the 50s, when the Haridas Mundra scandal broke out, India's first Prime Minister, Jawaharlal Nehru, had to call for the resignation of his finance minister, T.T. Krishnamachari. If you will recall, after the Beaufort scandal in 1989, Rajiv Gandhi lost the elections. If you recall, uh, in the Harshad Mehta scandal, which was in 92, 93, and Harshad Mehta had alleged that he'd paid one crore rupees in a bag, in a suitcase to Mr. Narasimha Rao, uh, a few years later in 1996, the Congress government lost power. So I don't know, it's difficult to predict the impact of these developments on politics in the future. You are not ruling out a change in the political situation in no, 2024? No, I, I cannot predict the political situation. I'm not an astrologer. I'm not a fortune player. I cannot predict the politics of this country. I can, I, As I'm, a journalist? I'm, but I'm, I'm just a student hmm. of poli the political economy. I'm just a reporter. I can't predict the future. I don't know what will happen one year from now. Or I don't even know what will happen tomorrow or day after. So I'm not in this... Uh, I'm not in the business of trying to guess. Uh, I, I'm not an astrologer. Are Court, you satisfied yes. with uh, the, how the mainstream media has reported this? You know, much of the mainstream media today in India is completely subservient to the government. I would say a very, very large proportion of the so-called mainstream media in India does not criticize the government. Mr. Modi is the first and only Prime Minister of India who's never given an unscripted, spontaneous, 
media conference. Every prime minister has. He has chosen the people. The same soft corner this media people have with the Adani also. I'll first come to that. First, I'll try and answer the first part of the yeah. question. So, Mr. Modi has picked and chosen the people he wants to, in, who can interview him. He's even agreed to be interviewed by a top income taxpayer, a citizen of Canada, popular actor Akshay Kumar. And among the various questions Akshay Kumar asked Mr. Uh, the Prime mm -hmm. Minister, Mr. Modi, is how, how do you like to eat your mangoes? Would you like to cut it or suck it? <laughs> you know, that kind of question. But you know, when this is the kind of atmosphere that is prevailing, when the offices of the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation in Delhi and Mumbai, have been, quote-unquote, surveyed by the Income Tax Department for three days, I don't understand whether that survey includes looking at telephones of the journalists and looking at the computers. So, Mr. Adani is a big player in the media. He's, uh, he's the owner of NDTV. So, NDTV in the initial stages hardly reported, if at all. Mm, yes. But uh, it is back to reporting. So, I'm saying that when something like this happens, which is so big, it's not just a story in India. It is an, an international, international story. story. Yeah. Uh, uh, publications, websites, news agencies across the globe are reporting about it. It's difficult for others to ignore such a huge story. So the mainstream media will continue, will be forced to report all these things in the days to come also. That's your interpretation of the facts. <laughs> Coming back to politics, see now Rahul Gandhi has undertaken a Bharat Jodo Yatra. Uh, do you see the, him as a force to reckon with or uh, any kind of another opposition formation taking shape in the 2020, uh, prior to the 2024 again, election? Again, it's a very difficult question to answer. No, no, o what is your uh, observation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I can't uh, predict the future. No, no. Now, all, all I, should I, be no, no, I can give you some facts. The facts are the Hindenburg report on the Adani group has united the opposition. Good. So, mm -hmm. whether it's Samajwadi Party, Ahmadmi Party, Trinamool Congress, Congress, Everybody is on the same side. The opposition, I mean. Yes, yeah. Now, about the Bharat Jodo Yatra, I think uh, the BJP's attempt to pay, you know, call Rahul Gandhi a pappu, you know, some sort of a useless, incompetent, no. uh, ineff ineffective, right. ineff ineffective leader, to that extent, the fact that he's walked for, well, what, 4,000 kilometers or thereabouts from Kanyakumari to Kashmir, has in my opinion, change that image. Also, I think um, the Bharat Jodo Yatra, it's too early to say what kind of impact it will have in terms of uh, votes for the Congress. But my personal view is that it will not weaken the Congress, it would strengthen the Congress. But, you know, the Lok Sabha elections are still more than one year away, mm -hmm. and therefore we can't say what can happen between now. Who could have imagined the impact that Pulwama and Balakot would have on the 2019 Lok Sabha elections? So the future is uncertain, and the future is very, very difficult to predict. So how are you going? To, how are you planning to move ahead? So you will be pursuing your kind of investigative journalism with more rigor. <laughs> I will continue to do my duty as a journalist. I believe uh, the journalist's job is to ask questions, ask difficult questions. Uh, and I think that's the job of a journalist, not to uh, uh, play the role of the public relations officer or the employee of an advertising agency. Because if you believe that journalism has a role to play in a democracy, you know you call it the fourth estate, then it has to hold truth to power. It has to ask difficult questions of those who are in positions of power and authority. That's the only way you can have greater transparency in public life. So at 67, uh, I don't know any other kind of journalism, so I'll continue to do what I have to do. Thank you very much, sir. You continue to speak truth to power. Thank, thank you. you very thank much you, much Mr. For Pupesh, us. for uh, asking me to come and speak to you. Thank you, sir. It's my, my pleasure, my honor, my privilege. Thank you, sir. Thank you.